Hello. Let's talk today about basic anatomy of the respiratory system. And uh, we are going to address practically proximal to distal direction, starting from external nose and nasal cavity, progressing further down through paranasal sinuses, pharynx, larynx, trachea, bronchi, and of course, lungs at the end of this presentation before we move on to physiology of the respiratory tract. If you don't mind, let me share the screen with you. And as we see it here, the respiratory system is illustrated in this compound diagram, practically pointing out to all of its important features and ingredients that we have to put together in order to assemble the tract. Our journey will start from the external nose, which is really like something that would require you to understand at least the basic composition of the skull and to know a little bit about piriform aperture and nasal bones before you can move on. Our next step is gonna to be to advance into nasal ca cavity, a little bit more complex and complicated part of the anatomy of the respiratory tract because for that one, you would also have to have a bit of understanding of what bones of the facial skeleton in particular do in order to not only assemble the nasal cavity, but also to have firm partition between left and right half, the nasal septum, which completely divides it into two separate non-communicating spaces. The diagram that we have in front of us doesn't address the paranasal sinuses that would be also requiring some knowledge about bones of the cranium, whereas frontal bone, sphenoid bone, maxilla, as well as ethmoid bone would all contain smaller or larger spaces that are directly communicating with the nasal cavity, hence the name, the paranasal sinuses. Obviously, the proper path for inspiration or inhalation would be to allow air to pass through the nasal cavity and then into pharynx, where as on this diagram, you realize that the oral cavity also has a direct con connection with the pharynx. So pharynx appears to be an organ which is shared between respiratory and digestive tract. But within the region of the neck, pharynx would continue as the rest of the digestive tract being seamlessly integrated into esophagus, but its inferior most part also has a direct contact for larynx or voice box. Larynx is really interesting cartilaginous structure being located in the lower neck. For that reason, we need to understand also what's going on with the spinal column cervical vertebrae in order to be able to position properly the larynx, which continues at the level of sixth cervical vertebra with a semicartilaginous pipe that is called the trachea or windpipe that dives into central part of the thoracic cavity. The cavity itself is composed of 12 thoracic vertebrae, 12 pairs of ribs, and anteriorly in the midline, it is the sternum or chest bone. Inferiorly, the thoracic cage will be almost completely sealed with the diaphragm. So thoracic cavity and abdominal cavity would not have any direct contact other than openings for structures that need to run through the diaphragm whether it's aorta, whether it's a major vein returning from the abdominal cavity, or simply the continuation of digestive tube esophagus that has to pass through the diaphragm before it can pass the content we just ingested into the stomach. Naturally, our journey through anatomy of the respiratory tract will stop at the level of lungs, where we can see two lungs left and right slightly asymmetrical because the space that we have between them is called the mediastinum and the mediastinum will have to primarily accommodate position of the heart that's going to be skewed a little bit more to the left side for that reason left lung appears to be a bit smaller than the right and other structures that are either directly con uh, connected to the heart like aorta 
superior vena cava or other structures that need to run through the mediastinum and to populate this seemingly hollow space. Let's move on to the next slide that is taking us to direction of photograph, which is using the cadaveric material, illustrating the thoracic cage being cut open using the frontal plane. All the structures within it appear to be dehydrated, a little bit wrinkled, but regardless of that, you still have good opportunity to see here center part of the thoracic cage, the mediastinum, which contains the heart packed with a pericardial sac, major blood vessels that are either going away from the heart or going into the heart like aorta, pulmonary trunk, and this is superior vena cava, and further away from the heart to both right and left side, you can see pulmonary tissue, lungs, the right-sided and the left lung. As stated just a couple of minutes ago, we're starting our journey through the respiratory system at the level of external nose. As one can see, external nose is partly built by bone. Primarily, it's the left and right-sided upper jaw bones, the maxillae, which between themselves form a fairly large opening on the anterior middle part of the skull that is called the piriform aperture. Maxillae will be joined by paired nasal bones. And as they do so, the piriform aperture is gonna get its full and complete shape. Piriform means shape like a pear. Although the bony parts are important, our external nose would not look as is without help of multiple cartilages that are adding form, size, and shape to our external nose. Although there are multiple cartilages, I'm going to mention here only a few, such as septal cartilage that sits in the midline, and together with the bony septum, it completely divides the nasal cavity into left and right non-communicating halves. Again, most of the side of the nose is generated by lateral nasal cartilages. As you can see, they're quite large, but then functionally very important C-shaped cartilage, which is called the ala. Ala, as we know, means the wing. And this C-shaped form of cartilage is actually responsible to maintain the viability and to keep open entrance into nasal cavity, the nostrils or nares. Anatomy of the external nose would be incomplete unless we mention some of the landmarks. The connection between nasal bones and the frontal bone, as I'm trying to point with my finger, I hope you can see it. This is where the root of the nose is. Then my finger will slide down all the way to the apex, following part of the nose, which is called the dorsum or the back of the nose. Sometimes this term is a little bit confusing because people just do not fully understand the anatomical terminology that something that is oriented forward actually in anatomy has the term of being the back of the nose, the dorsum of the nose. Side of the nose is known as the nasal ala or wings, hence the alar cartilages. And then, of course, we would have presence of two openings, left and right nostrils or nares. That could be decorated, quote unquote, with additional body hair that are called vibrissae. And that kind of body hair, which aesthetically speaking, we find sometimes not most pleasing part of anatomy are very functional because they serve as the first filter preventing any kind of macroscopically visible, visible particles to freely enter the nasal cavity. So vibrissae that are giving us the first line of defense against any foreign particles that we can accidentally inhale. 
From external nose, we would need to advance ourselves into nasal cavity. Part of nose, so to say, which is practically invisible, but on this diagram, which illustrates the midline or slightly away from the midline section through the skull, we can see what nasal cavity looks like and we can also evaluate its pretty much large space. Nasal cavity, we're talking about one of the two halves because they're going to be quite symmetrical. On their lateral wall, we'll have three quite prominent projections that are known as the nasal conche or nasal turbinates. There's upper, middle, and lower one, superior, middle, and inferior. Let's address this right away as why do we need to have these bulky parts projecting into nasal space. As you can perhaps get a little bit of information through their alternative name, the turbinates. They are to generate very turbulent flow of air as it passes through the nasal cavity and moves out through conhe, uh, through coana, I'm sorry, Conhe are projections, koane are openings that are communicating between nasal cavity and upper part of the pharynx. That turbulent flow of air actually has a very important purpose. Firstly, it is going to bounce multiple times off the walls of the nasal cavity, which is wet, mucus, sticky and any accidentally inhaled foreign particles are likely to be withheld on the very sticky surface of the nasal cavity itself. Secondly, it can change the temperature of the inhaled air, either absorbing a little bit of the heat if the air is too hot or from cardiovascular, from blood vessels that are heavily populating the nasal cavity. Very cold air will pick some heat and warm up before it moves further down into pharynx. Thirdly, nasal cavity will add moisture because air could be also quite dry. And finally, what is also very important, you can see on the upper part of nasal cavity, this darker red shaded area is pointing to where olfactory epithelium is located. Olfaction, special sense of smell, which essentially is only populating about upper third of the nasal cavity. So if inhaled air contains some, let's say, scented molecules, and if it goes straight forwardly, it will go shortest possible distance between the external nares and coane. Therefore, there would be no ability for detecting any kind of sense as the air moves in, becomes quite turbulent, regardless of how little or how much air we have inhaled, any scented molecules will likely be detected. And of course, that is going to be just part of our awareness about the environment that we're in. The roof of the nasal cavity is composed mostly by the ethmoid bone, and it is practically a very small bone containing multiple openings being known as the ethmoid sinuses, spaces associated to nasal cavity. And at the same time, what appears to be the roof of the nasal cavity is actually the floor of the cranial space because just above the ethmoid bone, the frontal lobes of the brain are situated together with first cranial nerve, olfactory nerve, or a special sense of smell, which sends its terminal fibers through ethmoid bone into upper third of the nasal cavity. The floor of the nasal cavity we call the palate. And as we know, there are two portions of the palate, one which is called the hard palate, composed of palatine processes of upper jaw bones, the maxillae, and left and right palatine bones. That is the hard palate, which as you can see, completely separates nasal from the oral cavity. But then the posterior part of the palate is called the soft palate because it's made of 
muscles, making its core, covered with the same mucous membrane that is lining the nasal and oral cavity. Because it's the muscular, soft palate will change its position. For example, as we have no need to eat or drink, it will fully relax as illustrated and it would become no obstacle for safe passage of air from nasal cavity into pharynx, further down into larynx and the rest of the lower respiratory tract. While we're eating, swallowing, whether it's solids or liquids, contraction of muscles of the soft palate will elevate it in practically the block, then block the exit from the nasal cavity. Our coanae are gonna be completely closed and maybe you can try it if you can just take a little sip of any liquid that you might have handy and try to swallow it at the same time as you're swallowing. If you try to inhale or exhale, you will find it to be absolutely impossible. So that is how pharynx could be possibly shared between oral cavity and pharynx as part of digestive tract versus nasal cavity and pharynx as the part of the respiratory tract. So mutually excluding activities that respiration doesn't go with the swallowing and the swallowing doesn't go with the respiration practically makes this being safe part of the body where we're not asking pharynx to do any kind of complex function regulating whether it is movement of air or movement of liquid or solid food being ingested. On this diagram, we can also say a few words about associated spaces. Some of the cranial bones are having hollow spaces that are known as the paranasal sinuses. What's going on? Mucous membrane from the nasal cavity becomes indented and starts invading into some of the bones of the skull which are unable to offer some kind of major physical resistance. As a result of this expansion process, bones such as frontal bone or body of the sphenoid bone, as well as body of upper jaw bone, the maxilla, will have fairly large air-filled spaces that are directly communicating with the nasal cavity. That is why we call them paranasal sinuses. They really assist the respiratory system because with every inspiratory effort, as the air moves turbulently into nasal cavity, it also finds the openings and goes into paranasal sinuses from where it forces out air previously inhaled. So we're going to have mixture of freshly inhaled air and air from a past cycle or past few cycles, practically just making sure that quality of air that we can push further down into pharynx, larynx, etc., is something that does not affect body in any negative form. Inflammation of sinuses, of course, could be one of the common moments that people will experience which means the sinus, due to swelling of its mucous membrane, becomes closed, stops communicating with the nasal cavity, cannot be drained of its content, and eventually, if bacterial infection is encountered, sinuses could be heavily infected, swollen with a larger population of bacteria, resulting in those typical episodes when people complain of headache, pain, which is sometimes projected kind of directly in between eyes, pain which intensifies as we move our heads. Usually it is something that is quite easily treated and once the episode of sinusitis is over, doesn't leave any long lasting negative consequences. So just to confirm, we have four different parts of the skull, the frontal bone, ethmoid bone, sphenoid bone, and upper jaw bone maxillae. 
that contained spaces filled up with air being called paranasal sinuses. Since this is just a very basic introductory part to anatomy of the respiratory tract, we're moving further down into anatomy of pharynx. Pharynx is simple hollow muscular tube, which is attached at the base of the skull. Part that is serving attachment of pharynx is the body of the sphenoid bone and the basilar part of the occipital bone, which I'm currently pointing with a cursor. Pharynx will extend all the way down to the level of sixth cervical vertebra. So this is vertebra one, this is number two, three, four, five, and six. And this is where administratively or arbitrarily, we say that's the end of pharynx and will continue further down as the esophagus. As you can see, the pharynx cannot be imagined as a plain tubular space because the tube actually has multiple openings. Firstly, we have left and right sided coane that will communicate between upper part of the pharynx or epipharynx with the nasal cavity. For that reason, the name that we also use is epipharynx or nasopharynx. At the level of soft palate and further below, we realize that there is a huge opening that is called the fauces, through which oral cavity and the middle part of the pharynx, mid pharynx or oropharynx have direct and unobstructed communication. And finally, as the lowest segment called laryngopharynx or hypopharynx, we're going to have contact, which is also direct between pharynx and laryngeal space or laryngeal cavity. If you're thinking even for a moment as what's happening, for example, when we swallow liquids, we would be afraid that the liquid would just somehow find its way and spill into laryngeal cavity. And we know it will trigger pretty significant cough reflex until we get rid of any foreign particles from the lower respiratory tract. Although we're not discussing larynx, not yet, I just want to point to this part of larynx, the epiglottis, the cartilaginous part of it, which is attached here to the rest of the larynx. However, it's most posterior and is free. So as we swallow, movement of the tongue backwards will push epiglottis down and will practically close the entrance into larynx. For that reason, it is perfectly safe to pass any content, whether it's solid or liquid, from oral cavity into lower parts of the pharynx, which will conduct it further down into esophagus and the rest of the digestive tube. In the nasopharynx or epipharynx, we're going to have two interesting details worth mentioning. One is what we certainly know, opening of the auditory or eustachian tube. This is one of these interesting moments in studying human anatomy, which explains that if we pinch the nose and we start blowing air as hard as we can, basically something is going to happen with our ears. They're going to feel like they're popping out. It is exactly because of this natural communication port. The reason for it to exist is very simple. It is our ears and eardrum which responds to sound waves by vibrating. In order to vibrate freely, on both sides of eardrum or tympanic membrane, atmospheric pressure must be the same. All of us have hopefully noticed if we go and submerge, maybe by a couple of meters below the water surface, pressure of water filling in our external ear canal pushes against the tympanic membrane and our sense of hearing becomes altered.
Same if we're traveling by an airplane and if the pressure in the cabin has sudden change, we may also have a need to pinch the nose to blow some air and to resume with the normal hearing. So that is the value of the eustachian tube to keep equal pressure of the atmospheric air on the both sides of tympanic membrane so our hearing doesn't become impaired. During the common cold season, let's say flu-like diseases season, it is very common to have upper respiratory tract infection and upper respiratory tract infection causes the same swelling of the mucous membrane, which may temporarily obstruct the opening of the auditory tube, again resulting in a couple of days of having some difficulties hearing without chance to eventually equalize the pressure. From another clinically important point of view, if upper respiratory tract infections are caused by some kind of resilient bacterial strain, they could advance from pharynx through the eustachian tube and unfortunately the infection could spread into middle ear generating condition that is known as the otitis media middle ear infection usually it's a smaller children who are having it sometimes as a solitary episode but sometimes as a recurring problems that are affecting them specifically during the fall and winter season and of course that is part of anatomy which is to be blamed for allowing bacterial spread through eustachian tube to reach the middle ear. Other important detail that should not be forgotten is this that is pointing to pharyngeal tonsil. Normally when people talk about tonsils, we're thinking about tonsils that are inside the oral cavity, so-called the palatine tonsils, left and right. It is a little bit less known part that other than two palatine tonsils, we also have pharyngeal tonsil that is in early childhood significantly larger. And also the dorsum of the tongue would have its tonsillar apparatus being called the lingual tonsil. We know that tonsils belong to immune system and practically they're strategically arranged around two different entry points into our body. One being nasal cavity, the other one being oral cavity, which could bring lots of lots of dirt and contaminants into our body. Remember how small children they find something, they get it into their hands, and then first thing they do with it is that they try to put it into their mouth. So obviously that we're naturally inclined towards this type of exploring the world in our earliest <laughs> days on this planet. However, because all the different bacterial and microscopically visible contaminants essentially start stimulating tonsils, whether it's pharyngeal, palatine, or lingual tonsil, to start producing our preferred immune response. So we're to gain sometimes short-lasting, but sometimes long-lasting or even lifelong-lasting immunity towards specific microorganisms. Middle part of the pharynx or oropharynx is having no particular details that would be worth our time. Neither we have more anatomy to add to hypopharynx or laryngopharynx. We can just say here, it is a contact between pharynx and larynx that could be made open or closed based on the position of epiglottis. So by completing our review of the pharynx, we can say that is what actually the upper respiratory tract is. Nose, nasal cavity, pharynx. And this is where we have those common episodes of upper respiratory tract infections. The lower part of it, starting from larynx further down, appears to be a little bit more at the distance from the body surface. And as such, 
actually start splitting the rest of the system in place that we call the lower respiratory tract. Larynx, trachea, bronchi, bronchial tree, and lungs are the lower respiratory tract. So if we're okay with this, we can just take another quick look and see yellow, blue, and red colored segments of pharynx, nasal, oral, and laryngopharynx. And we can now move to first important organ of the up lower respiratory tract. It's the larynx. Larynx is a little bit of miracle because although it looks like just the cartilaginous part of the respiratory tract, it does have one extremely important function that is built into it. It is our ability to produce sounds. And that's why it's called the voice box. Of course, not every single word that we say comes from larynx. Rather, larynx produces the bass tone, which becomes further modified either by our teeth, palate, cheeks, uh, uh, lips, including some sounds that require a little bit more of a resonance. Therefore, nasal cavity and uh, paranasal sinuses could be used in order to produce different qualities of sound. But ultimately, it is the larynx, which is the power generator of sound that keeps coming as the air moves in between left and right true vocal cords, forcing them to vibrate. And that means vibration essentially creates the sound. Since we're not in a program that is going to be obsessed about our ability to speak coherently or not, we're more concerned about anatomical structure to find out what the larynx is made of and how do we apply it then to our studies of the respiratory tract. Larynx is mostly composed of cartilages of which three major ones are coming as single cartilages. Let's name them. It's epiglottis, it is the thyroid cartilage, and it is the cricoid cartilage. And then it has three different pairs of cartilages that are smaller. And one pair is particularly important. You can see it here on the right side of the screen. There are arytenoid cartilages. They're directly related to our vocal cords, and they are going to be part of important system which tightens or relaxes the vocal cords, making more or less space between them, practically ensuring that we have perfect mechanism that can add to our ability to breathe more volume of air, or if it tightens up the cords, it is going to practically help us generate proper voices, proper sounds that we turn into words and into speech. Other two very small paired cartilages are corniculate cartilage sitting on the very top of the arytenoid. And we have a cuneiform cartilage that is not even illustrated here. So they have much less significance. Therefore, you really don't have to worry so much about them. Make sure that you understand these three single ones, epiglottis, thyroid, and cricoid. And of three paired cartilages, arytenoid cartilage becomes the most important. Cartilages are connected by thick membranes that are given their names. As you can see, this membrane connects the hyoid bone which is really not part of the skeleton. It is also a piece of cartilage that we have in the upper part of the neck that eventually would ossify as we get older. So thyrohyoid membrane, then we have between thyroid and cricoid, cricothyroid membrane, ensuring that these are not just loosely formed elements between which air can move freely in and out, and of course, we're gonna have a little bit of flexibility, so to say, almost like joints being generated between laryngeal cartilages so that they can move relative to each other. 
Epiglottis, as you can see, has about 99% of its circumference free. On its stem, the petiolus is what is used to attach it to the inside aspect of the thyroid cartilage. I know this is not the most appropriate comparison, but you can think about old fashioned type of household garbage cans, the one with a pedal. You know, you depress the pedal and the lid goes up this way. And when you remove your foot off the pedal, the lid goes down. So that is exactly what the epiglottis cartilage will do as its own movement, pushing it down. It closes the larynx, allowing it to re-expand and to go into its anatomical position. Basically, larynx becomes ready for additional work that is part of the respiratory tract. The cricoid cartilage, as you can see, is shaped like a full ring. Perhaps these two diagrams cannot illustrate it, but word is not so complex to understand. It's a full circle shaped cartilage. Its most posterior part is a little bit more massive and it's called the lamina or plate of the cricoid cartilage. And on the top of cricoid lamina, we're gonna have spot for attachments of left and right sided arytenoid cartilages. Arytenoid cartilages are not fixed on the top of the cricoid. This is also some form of a nicely mobile joint. So the gap between left and right arytenoid cartilage could be made smaller or wider. And also they can lean backwards, leaning forwards, which will increase or decrease tension that they produced on the voice box, on the voice cord, oh, vocal cords, I'm sorry, voice box, vocal cords. What is not illustrated here, but one has to know is lots of different voluntarily controlled striated muscles that are part of the laryngeal anatomy because only with muscles that are perfectly well trained, we would be able to generate sounds that we convert into words, sentences, phrases, speeches that become understandable to people that we're addressing. Therefore, laryngeal innervation is also very much voluntarily done Muscles are not given a choice as do they do this or that. It is the brain which sends the commands through the peripheral nervous system, through nerves, to innervate laryngeal muscles and they would set up the stage for production of proper sounds that will be making us possible to produce coherent sound and speech. Position of the larynx itself measured from the very top to the bottom of the cricoid cartilage corresponds to the level between C3 down to C6 cervical vertebra. At the same time, as this diagram has one important anatomical structure that neighbors the larynx, this is the thyroid gland. Thyroid gland belongs to endocrine system and as such is not really part of the laryngeal anatomy. But larynx ranging from C3 to C6 is certainly not at the same level where the thyroid gland is found. Practically, it extends itself between C5 down to T1, eventually T2 vertebra, depending on its size. So it is important in order to do the palpation of the thyroid gland, the easiest landmark to find on the anterior neck is certainly in males, Adam's apple, the most prominent part of the neck anteriorly. It's something that doesn't require lots of experience to find and to palpate. Therefore, palpation of the thyroid gland will have to be directed further downward at the expected level where the thyroid gland is to be found. So practically 
level of C5, C6, C7, maybe even T1 vertebra, but clearly not leveled with larynx C3 to C6. And while we're at this diagram, it is worth mentioning that posterior to the thyroid gland, we would have four, typically four, but sometimes these numbers are different, parathyroid glands that are more or less embedded into the thyroid gland. Parathyroid and the thyroid glands are complementary to each other because through parath hormone and calcitonin, they regulate metabolism of ionic calcium, which we need for a variety of different functions, including, of course, depositing it into bone tissue that is resulting in a hardening of the bone. But ionic calcium is also very important for proper functioning of the central nervous system, as well as a mineral without which contraction of muscles would not be possible. So for that reason, balance of ionic calcium must be monitored, and it is done in the closest cooperation between thyroid gland producing calcitonin and parathyroid gland producing hormone that is called parathyroid. Hormone. On the cross section through larynx, which we have to do here, we can identify epiglottis. This is its petiolus, which attaches the epiglottis to the thyroid cartilage. This is half of the cricoid cartilage, as you can see, quite thin anteriorly and much thicker and bulkier posteriorly. That's the lamina. And this is the arytenoid cartilage. The retinoid cartilage is shaped like a little pyramid and at its base it does have this projection which is called the vocal process. On the very tip of the vocal process the vocal fold or true vocal cord is attached with one end and with its opposite end it will attach to the thyroid cartilage. Above it will be ventricular fold or the false vocal cord. Basically nothing more than just mere duplication and fold of the mucous membrane that is lining the larynx. False vocal cord does not vibrate, does not change its position, and it's found superiorly relative to vocal fold or the true vocal cord. This is hyoid bone. As we can see, a little bit of adipose tissue definitely will fill in any kind of void spaces. And once again, you have a nice viewing to thyrohyoid or the cricothyroid ligament inferior or membrane. Inferior to the cricoid cartilage, basically we're entering the tracheal space. Trachea will maintain its mostly cartilaginous belt but it would be composed of C-shaped cartilages that are stuck one on the top of another, mutually connected with each other. Remind you that cricoid cartilage is the only part of the respiratory system which is shaped like full 360 degrees circle. It ensures the viability and openness of the lower respiratory tract to allow movement of air in and out. Should it be less than the full circle, unfortunately, the entire respiratory system would be highly susceptible to some kind of collapses, which if they happen, could affect quite severely the respiratory tract. And at that point, basically can start affecting our life. Although you would not be performing this type of exam, it is good to understand what the larynx and its vocal folds would look like. In uh, all four of the diagrams, we have superior view into the larynx from the above, and left-sided diagrams are just showing cartilages and one muscle on each diagram, just illustrating how these muscles actually could affect the shape and the position of vocal fold. 
Whereas the right-sided diagrams, something that one would be able to see if using a laryngoscope, is larynx of a living person with way less details to be observed. So let's take a look at this. Arytenoid cartilages with their vocal processes serve as the attachment point for the vocal fold. When muscles abduct the arytenoid cartilage, basically they're also widening the gap between the vocal folds. And this is typically happening when we have a need to have really like maximal inspiratory efforts to inhale and exhale at a rapid pace. Lower diagram positions left and right vocal folds practically next to each other. And that is when other straight and voluntarily controlled muscle is called to act in order to adduct vocal folds. This is happening, for example, when we're whispering and if we whisper for a long period of time, basically our vocal folds will be hitting each other multiple times over a short period of time. And unfortunately that could result in a little bit of raspiness. So it is better to talk using the normal volume of our voices rather than to go into whisper or some kind of extreme shouting also could do a little bit of a temporary damage to vocal folds. On the right hand side, two diagrams are illustrating position of more pale vocal folds versus a little bit closer to red, pink red colored false vocal cords that are sitting above the true vocal cords. When a patient is instructed to just breathe, obviously vocal folds will abduct, will go away from each other and movement of air will be unobstructed. When a, pa a person is instructed to vocalize, one can see that gap between vocal folds is closing. And of course, as a result of that, a voice or sound could be heard as it's generated by laryngeal cartilages. I think that for the next part, we might be better off by cutting presentation at this point after we completed nose, nasal cavity, pharynx, and larynx before we move into what truly is the lower part of the respiratory tract, starting with the trachea and then bronchial tree, and of course, anatomy of the lungs. I suggest we make this as a second video that is related to the first one. So give us a little bit of time to relax. You can also relax on your own, and we will continue with part two, starting from the trachea. Thank you.